Today's guest is Minel Symbols artist Iman Cervantes. Iman stands for Emmanuel, which translates from Hebrew into God is with us. Now, whether or not you lean one way or another as far as spiritual beliefs are concerned matters not. What does matter is that Eman's full first name is very appropriate for him. He's a lover, not a fighter. I mean, the guy is sweet. He's kind through and through. Definitely the kind of person you want on your roster should you be an artist relations manager like me. Eman also loves coffee and good coffee too. He's either incredibly generous or incredibly manipulative because <laughs> he's figured out that sending me insanely great coffee works as far as staying on my good side. Jokes aside, Eman and I both have a strong love for strong coffee, and he's always eager to share some with me in the mail. So thanks, Eman. I was first introduced to Eman from another Minel Symbols artist, J.P. Bouvet. Now, J.P. has only ever recommended one other artist to me, and that was Matt Garska. So his track record's good. I know his word is gold. So one day, J.P. calls me, and he tells me about a band that a band he was touring with had opened up for and that the drummer of this headlining band was great and that he was also a really good guy and that I should probably look into him. So of course, I did. And I'm really glad I did. E-Man is a very appreciated and loved part of our Minel Symbols family. When he's not on the road playing drums for pop star Andy Grammer, he's in the studio. That's his life, road and the studio. And he's a big fan of both. He's great at both. We filmed a lot of video content with E-Man for Minel, and his experience in the studio shows every time. He just nails take after take with total ease. So I caught up with E-Man during this current downtime from the road, and we chatted about all kinds of things. I always have a really enjoyable time shooting the breeze with him, and I hope that you guys enjoy the podcast as much as I did. So I'd like to welcome everybody into the Minel Radio Podcast. Today we've got Eman Cervantes with us. Eman, dude, thank you so much for being on the show. I am happy to be here. There is uh, a lot happening, but regardless, like it's nice to, to be able to focus on you know this right now, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. So, man, I... I was looking, you know, I have to do my due diligence. Even if I know a person, I still dig around and see if there's some stuff that I didn't know. And I knew that like your list of credits is a pretty heavy hitting list, but I was doing a once over on your website, emandrums.com. And dude, the credits are really impressive. Um, The list has these well-known stars as well as these serious behind the scenes, side men, heavy hitter guys. you know, dudes that maybe not everybody knows, but a lot of people would know, guys like Steve Lukather. Um, yeah. He, so it has a really impressive list of TV appearances and venues you've played. So I have to compliment you, though, on being such a oh, down-to-earth and humble guy, considering what the credits you have uh, <laughs> that you could strut about. So I want to know the humility that you have that you've literally carried uh, since day one, as far as I've known you. What do you attribute that to, and do you ever have to remind yourself to not act out in an entitled artist tantrum? Uh, well, I think a lot of that came from acting out like an entitled little asshole. Can I curse? <laughs> I always ask that in every podcast, and everybody's like, "Hell oh, yeah, yes, it's cool." Um, you need to curse, <laughs> damn it, curse. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I always think about this because, um, I had a, and I still do, and it's something I actively work on. I can just be a dick. And uh, a lot of that comes from I am I am the the baby of the family. I have an older sister and an older brother, um, and just having to compete for attention and and you know it's like y- you grow up kind of uh, having to throw a tantrum to say like oh something's going on with him and it's probably unrelated to the tantrum. Now as an adult, I know this right, but uh, yeah, I, I think I just got my butt kicked so much emotionally as a kid because I was always wanting attention that at some point you're just kind of like 
it, it, none of this really matters. Like, how, does does that random dog think I'm a good human? And is it going to, like, sense my real vibe? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I just feel like I, maybe I'm not answering this correctly, but I think I was just such a jerk growing up. And eventually I realized that just wasn't going to work. Well, I'm having trouble figuring you to be a jerk growing up, but... Um... You know, like having an aha moment is always interesting. So was there an aha moment where you thought jerk doesn't work? <laughs> hmm. If not, that's totally was, cool. But Yeah, no, no, no. There was definitely a few. Uh, and I say that like in college, like, I, you know, I went to a really small community college uh, called Citrus College. And, and uh the program was run by Rand, Rund, I don't know, whatever. It, it was it was operated by basically two dudes. It's kind of uh, Robert Slack and uh, still one of my mentors, Alan Waddington. Alan is like uh, Yoda in the best sense possible. And He's small Robert and green. Slack, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> small and white, but yeah. Um, and he was like a, in an 80s hair band. Uh, called the Unforgiven, and they, you know they had a record deal, and they did Live Aid. It was great, you know. And he's he knows that side of the business, uh, and and Robert Slack is like a lead trumpet player, was a lead trumpet. Uh, he probably still plays, but he was a lead trumpet player, trumpet player for the Buddy Rich Big Band at one point. So he has that side of his personality. <laughs> so and he so, got his ass kicked by Buddy Rich often. Exactly. You no, know, yeah, I mean, he he had many a stories about Buddy. And, but my favorite thing about now realizing where I was and what was happening at that school was there was dudes who could play significantly better than me at, you know, 18, 19. And the one thing that I noticed was they always were just fun to hang around with they were cool dudes and even if like in the heat of the battle right you're god and this sounds so stupid because it's a community college but you're in this this world where you're performing and you're you know you're playing with with all these other people that are in your same age group and if somebody made a mistake i usually would just call them out and i remember we were playing in hawaii this is this is a whole other story but we won't get into it but we this is we had these these gigs in Hawaii, and so we're in Hawaii, and we're playing in Hawaii. It's amazing. It's beautiful. You're supposed to be relaxed. And I remember I'd show up to, I was like 18, I'd show up to every one of these gigs just kind of like ready to chop people's heads up for fucking up. And I was like, I remember one time this bass player started a song in the wrong key, and I just lost it on him. I just, like, while I'm playing, right? And I was like... Somebody came up to me after and was like, "Hey man, you probably shouldn't be doing that." <laughs> you know, wow. and I was like, "Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Like that's not cool." And so I remember that um my brother is about 10 years older than I am, so he, he, him and I always have these conversations, you know, still yeah. to this day. And and I think those aha moments should or, or these like, "Ooh, I shouldn't be doing that." should continuously be happening to people you know and i if i can even say this like i feel like this country is having one of those moments right now and i think mm. it's really cool to be like whoa something is wrong let's see if we can fix this yeah well in theory there could be a few people listening to this show that either have not heard of you or have but they don't know the full scoop on you so Without like taking up the complete rest of our time, uh, not that you're a talky guy. I'm just saying, like, just to be careful. Like, tell us about, give us the you know the quick version about how drums came into your life, how you learned to play, and then how your path brought you to where you are today. Yeah, so uh, I think like a lot of people that uh, first of all, I'm I'm Mexican. I'm I'm the byproduct of immigrants. Both my parents moved here in the early '80s. Um, very thankful for that decision that they took, right? If, if I wouldn't be here unless they made that incredible decision. Um, yes, there was a U-Haul involved. Yes, it wasn't legal. Figured it out. They're both U.S. citizens now. It's great. <laughs> I'm very thankful for all of that, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, but I think if, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking to you right now, right? So very, I have to say that my parents 100% is the reason that I play drums. 
Secondly, I grew up very, very religious in a very small Christian church where there was only one other drum guy, drum, drum set player. And by the time I was five, I could play at the same caliber as him. So, it, and, and I come from this musical family. Like my dad plays guitar and, and uh, is a singer songwriter. My brother's a great piano player producer and engineer now so you know I was around it but it wasn't like you need to go play drums you you know it was never forced on me I just kind of I remember like earliest memory I've said this before is my dad holding me and spinning a cymbal um Mm. that's like my very first memory uh and then you know it's like oh this kid can wait a minute wait 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 wait. I'm gonna interrupt you here because I want to compare notes your earliest memory at all in life is your dad holding you and spinning a symbol and that's so poignant considering your occupation it, my right. earliest it, 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 my earliest what's memory you, what's that what's yours oh okay yeah that, this is thing i'm gonna say my earliest memory because it's just bullshit compared to your earliest <laughs> memory my earliest memory is i'm on the front porch of my grandmother's house and the like you know those like you've got those little wrought iron rails that go up the side of concrete steps and they have little wrought iron like slats that go down. Well, I got my head stuck between two of the (laughs) slats and I panicked and I'm, and I trying to pull my head back in. And my older brother, who's three years older was, I I mean, I was probably two and he was like five and my grandma's dog whiskey was, uh, you know, running around barking and chase, just being all crazed because I was crazed. And dude, that's my earliest memory right there. My head stuck between slats on a front porch. <laughs> I think it actually I mean, speaks volumes to what I do now. <laughs> yeah, are are the artists the uh, the one of those in this? Uh... <laughs> no, I don't. I'm, I'm just, kidding. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. I mean, not really, but. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, it's I just funny. I understand. Yeah, no, so that I like, I can vividly remember, and I, a lot of it's probably from association, right? Like, I, as a five year old or six year old, I remember that that drum set was red and it was a Tama and it was a rock star with the pearl, like that Jeff Picaro pearl rack. And, but that, that crash symbol was a 16 inch symbol and i'll never forget that symbol like i know exactly like the grooves I, I would just stare at it when i was a kid so like um yeah so i started playing at that church when i was five and my parents didn't leave that church till uh i was 13 so i was eight years right and there were tuesday night services thursday night rehearsals friday night services and these aren't like typical ccm christian contemporary like services these are like two hours two and a half hours three hours long uh where the music was at least an hour hour and a half long and uh saturday my dad had written some pretty popular like worship songs so we we'd travel to you know what seemed really far away van eyes or <laughs> <laughs> or or like uh i don't know just like it is, you know, you're a kid, so your your perception of how something f- really far is is different. Um, so we would we would travel quite a bit on Saturdays, and then Sundays there was like two services and then a night service, and you know, by the time I was ten, I was playing every single one of those services. So uh, I I learned a lot of really invaluable things growing up there. And then my brother, who I had said is about ten years older, he had gotten a gig at a at a uh, predominantly white church. Uh, and they needed a drummer and he's like, ah, my little brother can play. And so then that turned into a thing where I'd get to play with people that were a lot older than me, mostly volunteers still. Um, and I, you know, just kept playing, but there was suddenly music was involved, like real charts and, and, uh, you know, playing a Christmas, uh, like, a you know, like a Christmas spectacular thing or an Easter show. And it was like three and a half hours worth of music with cues and all this stuff. And it was just a snowball from that point, you know? Um, and then I started playing at other churches and that's how I met Andy Grammer's bass, bass player. Who's the MD. I met him when I was 13 or 14, you know? Wow. Um, and then, you know, we played together at churches on and off for you know 10 years after that and 
went to high school, played in jazz band, you know, did did the normal thing, took lessons from this great drummer named Joey Kay. Uh, at one of these churches, uh, the great Ricky Lawson used to be a volunteer because he lived around the corner. Mm. And so I got to hang out with Ricky Lawson and I got to study with Ricky Lawson. And, uh, you know, he, he taught me where to place a snare drum in on two and four or wherever you want it to be you know was he a tough love kind of teacher or was he easy going oh 100 percent. i mean and the thing about the lessons with him were that they weren't ever really lessons it was more like uh, i'll show you this you know or like well i'll i remember this so vividly i was playing a church and i before i knew who he was right and if you don't i've said this before if you don't know who ricky lawson is get on google type in his name and then watch your draw drop it's like the the guy played with everybody right and i remember i was playing and it was like a saturday night i was probably 14 or 15 and i see him walking in and i i knew he was one of the drummers but i didn't know who he was and he walked up to me after and he goes hey man why, why you gotta be playing all that shit <laughs> and i'll never forget that and then that next sunday he played and I still, I think I still have the VHS of him playing at that Sunday service. And it's, it's like, he's playing worship music, right? Like late nineties, early two thousands worship music. And the amount of passion and power and care for these not really good songs, but the beat <laughs> and, and how he's placing his hi-hat and why he would hit. He's the first guy that I noticed would like hit a, a higher pitch symbol going into a chorus and a lower pitch symbol going into a verse because that is a dynamic tonal change not just it's a crash symbol but like there's some sort of emotion to playing a darker sounding tone going back to a down part of you know what i mean like all these things i started noticing and that was because he was doing it um now I'm rambling, but yeah, so I, did, I you know, I, I come from the church background and then I went to, like I said, this college called Citrus College, got my ass kicked. I started with this guy named Mike Packer there, uh, Alan Waddington. Uh, I started with this amazing percussionist named Lynn Vartan. She's like, nar- that, that, that woman taught me how to read music in like three months. Wow. And... It was amazing. I mean, I think her whole doctorate degree was in the study of how people learn, right? So she figured out how I learned, and because of that, she was able to to, to directly teach me in the f- easiest, most comprehensive way possible. Wow. So, how efficient and lucky is that? Yeah. And it was like, you know, I had gone two years prior to that with these other teachers and they, they kind of were like, let's play off your strengths. And she was the complete opposite. She was like, you suck at this. Let's work on that. And this is how you're going to work on that, you know? And oh. yeah, I just remember if you're familiar, there's like these, uh, if you're a drummer, you've probably seen these books, the, the Mitchell Peters books, and there's three of them, the snare drum, or like snare drum exercises books. And I remember I got through all three of those in three months where I, I couldn't I, I couldn't tell you the difference between a quarter note and an eighth note, you know, and uh, that's 100 percent, you know, thank you to Lynn Vartan. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So okay, that was a lot after, of talking. <laughs> so wait, no, no, no. After all that education, um, you, after college, what was your jump from college into professional drumming as a career? Like, what was your first uh, dumb, step? Well, a lot of it was dumb luck. So, after after I, f- I kind of finished uh, three years at the school, and, uh, you know, we, we got back from a little tour that the school would do, like I said, to Hawaii. Um, there, was, there was one moment, and this is how, like, Steve Lugather comes into, uh, you know, the periphery. That was a pun of of uh of my story i guess or my career and it's uh alan waddington was friends with this producer named joey carbone he was producing this singer named joseph williams if you don't uh, joseph williams is one of the singers of toto <clears throat> and he was working on a new album and they for some reason thought i would be the right guy for it so <laughs> 
again, it's like dumb luck in a, in a weird sense, but I remember getting three demos uh, and going into a studio, tracking it, and as soon as I heard, when I'm listening to these demos, I was like, holy crap, this is Toto. Like, this isn't... Like, I remember walking in this alleyway by my parents' old place, and I listened to the first song, a song called This Fall, and the riff starts, and I go, that's Steve Lukather, without knowing it's Steve Lukather, right? Because I was already a Toto fan. And then I hear the bass come in, and... and and I was like, holy crap. And then I hear the keys come in. And it was just like a snowball, right? And I'm going, holy crap, the only thing missing here is Jeff. And it, it freaked me out. But then I was kind of like, no, th- th- this is where I get to show that I can hang, right? And I was probably 21, if I remember correctly. And I went in. I did three songs. I think I did a really good job. They called me back. I did three more. So on this album of nine songs or ten songs, I th- I played the majority of it, and then uh, Rick Morata played the rest. So it was kind of like this really cool thing as a twenty year old, where you're going like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, you know. So like wow. you know, there's all these great musicians on there. You know, like Bob Birch is playing bass. We even got like my friend from the college to play bass on one of them. This guy named Sean Barrett, who's a great composer now. So it was just a really cool moment at that time. And that was a perfect, like in between, right? Like, okay, I'm done with school. What the hell am I doing next? And what was great about all of that was they kept me around as like a paid player, almost in a sense, while their younger guys were, you know, getting up to speed and at some point I forget when it was one of the guys that had gone to that school a drummer named Anthony Legerfo who now plays with uh, Lucas Nelson and the promise of the real and uh, Lucas Nelson is uh, Willie Nelson's son he plays with Willie also and he plays with uh, oh I'm going blank and he's going to kill me for this sorry Anthony Uh, give me Neil Young he plays with Neil Young and uh he had moved to Switzerland to play with a bunch of different artists under this one record label and he had had enough and they wanted to use somebody that he might be familiar with. Right. So they had an audition and I got the audition. And so that was like, I think 2008, 2009 and I moved to Europe for a year. (laughs) Wow. Wow. It, it's funny thinking about this because you don't think about this, right? And it's like, yeah. oh, that that happened and this happened, and I mean, really, yeah, it all so. it all connects. But you know, the the two takeaways I've heard so far is that when you were thirteen, you met the bass player for the current uh, big road gig that you're on at the moment, and yeah. when you were in college, you had an instructor who helped you get a gig with the dudes from Toto on one of their solo records. So, yeah. what I've basically kept thinking about what what I was thinking about from those two things is it doesn't hurt to be cool from the very start. It's not like, well, you know, I'm going to just do what I do. Like, um, once I hit 21, then I'll be pro about things right now. I'm just going to be a kid and enjoy it. Well, yeah, of course be a kid and enjoy it, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, man, I mean, anything can happen at any time and it can just be something as simple as not being, maybe kind to the person you're hanging with or a hundred percent. And, and, and then, that's one of the yeah. great things that they would teach us. And Mr. Slack would always say this. And in the band room where I still call him Mr. Slack. That's funny. Uh, where in the band room where the big band would rehearse and the, and like the top 40 groups would rehearse. It was like, you know, a, a pretty solid door that was like an oversized solid door. And then there was like a little window that was maybe eight and a half by five feet. And so you, it was meant to, you know, put uh, flyers up and whatnot. And he would always say, you never know who's looking through that glass window. You never know. And uh, it's making me think that uh, Joey Carbone, that producer was walking around with Alan one day while I happened to be playing. So I know it wasn't just like this kid should do it even though I think that would have had enough weight, it was literally them watching me play and saying like, that kid's got a good pocket. Maybe we can work with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so it's, um, yeah, it's just, it's really, it's really interesting to look back. And again, yeah, like I I met Zach when I was 13 
what's what are the chances right i know yeah <laughs> that's crazy well so um in your mind are you andy grammer's drummer or are you a sideman session drummer for hire i'm curious about how you internally self-identify i would identify as both um when i work for him uh throughout the year like he gets my undivided attention right it's 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 um kind of like a loyalty thing like the guy has uh, the guy pays for me to be around right and for me to play drums on anything he needs me to do and then other stuff too like for a long time i, I shot all of his podcasts like video shooting editing all that stuff um and and for me it's it it became a thing of like any second that I can work for him is only going to build more of a rapport and more of a relationship outside of me being his drummer, which then turns into like, I like this human being, right? I like this dude. Um, and when I'm not working with him, I'm available to everybody. Right. And I think, I think that's just fair. I don't I don't know if I put too much thought into it, but I think it's just fair. If I'm not currently in a room with you there or working on music to be in a room with you, that I should be allowed to do whatever I want. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it's just, it seems fair to me in my head. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, well, prior to all this COVID horse hockey that we're experiencing... <laughs> When you were at home in L.A. off tour, I think you've told me before that you, when you weren't on (coughs) tour with Andy, you would do pretty much any type of gig around L.A. Um, Is that somewhat correct? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I have built... Yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, so what what I'm curious about is, out of all the random gigs you do when COVID is not the thing and you're not on tour with Andy, um, what's like... I thought, out of all those random gigs, which one is the most fun for you? And which one is something that you kind of have to psych yourself up for a little bit in order to do it? Well, I'll answer the second part of that question first. I think, I think I'm at a place now where I don't have to take a gig. So I, I take the gigs and that might change after this whole COVID thing. Right. I might, I think we're all going to be, you know, I, I saw a, a joke somebody was like uh bus tour uh actually in a van uh (laughs) no no per diem and it'll be three weeks and you make 250 bucks and it said like uh everybody's gonna audition for that right that's a joke right but i think it might get to something where the demand is going to be so high right so but now i i just kind of take the gigs that I want to take and what's fun is I can focus my energy on the relationships that I want to keep if that makes sense so if um if somebody calls me for a gig and the money's not very good but I like the people I'm gonna do it if if somebody calls me for a gig the money is crazy high and I don't want to be around those people I won't take the gig and some people may be like oh you take every gig it's an opportunity this is true, and I 100% agree with that. But at the same time, my mental sanity and my emotional state is more valuable than any sort of amount of money. So uh, yeah, that's no, kind I of my that. approach. And I forgot the first part of your question. <laughs> um, it's, my first part was out of all those random types of gigs, which types are the most fun for you? Is it big band? Is it a wedding gig? Um yeah. Oh, I love. I it doesn't matter. I mean, a, a church gig or a wedding thing, or um, you're right, a big band thing. I did a big band gig right before Christmas where I subbed for one of my one of my close friends, another incredible drummer named Brian Taylor, and I went in and I had to read a bunch and I hadn't read it in a, two years. I had to actually read music and it was just dance music. It wasn't even, you know. It, something that required me to actually use my brain and I completely sucked but it was so much fun and everybody knew like like oh he's just subbing it's cool that there was no pressure right and it, it was just really awesome it really was I, I, like I had so much fun 
getting humbled, if that makes sense, kind of circling back to that first point where it was, it was kind of like, sometimes you have to be hump, get humbled in front of other people and your peers. And then that, that forced me to then come home and like literally start reading again, working on my reading again, just so I don't have that experience. Not that it was Mm. terrible, but it wasn't very good. Yeah. Yeah. So total shift here. Uh, I'm curious if you, I know you record a lot of things in your studio, but let's say you got to show up to somebody's random session and laws of the universe at that very moment dictate that you could only bring three snare drums or laws of the universe dictate only two snare drums or finally laws of the universe dictate only one snare drum. So for each Mm. scenario, like what would it be for three snare drums, then two, then one? And you don't uh, like don't don't tell me it depends on what the music is. Just say that okay. like just tell like what I'm telling you is the parameter is hey dude we need you for a session tomorrow. Can't tell you what it is. Can't tell you what to bring. Just show up and be ready to record. Okay. Yeah, I had this happen a couple of years ago. A friend of mine called me to randomly do an art a session with a, an artist and uh it was at an amazing studio and <laughs> I didn't have anything at home with the exception of three drums, which is hilarious, right? Uh, I had a really old Ludwig, a brand new in the box Tama aluminum drum, and uh, I'm I'm trying to find it. And then I had this like very boutique snare. That's kind of the perfect scenario, right? You get a very high end. It was like a it's a. Do you know Cooper Akuten? I'm not trying to shout him out, but do you know who he is? No. Uh, he he makes um he makes really high end drums, like just crazy high end drums, and then like uh so that drum is like stainless steel and like uh really nice mahogany maple kind of thing so it, it has wood and metal so cool so i was like well there's one answer then then the aluminum drums kind of like an acrylite i took that and then the old vintage drum does the old vintage thing and that, that would work and then from that point i think i would if i had two i would take the super fancy drum and the super old drum and if i had one i would probably just take the acrylite style one because that one will kind of do both of those so the super old drum was it metal or wood? It's wood. It's mahogany. Okay. It's like three ply mahogany with uh, maple reinforcement hoops. It's, it's gorgeous. It's old, and you can find them for like two hundred bucks if you really look huh. for them. You know. Well, uh, let's say you're on. You're being called to that same session, and dude tells you, "All right, dude, you can only bring." one set of hats, one bride, and one crash. <laughs> and this is, of course, the only shameless self-promotion we'll do for Minel on this. Um, now, <laughs> oh, I mean, you I thought know- I was going to say Minel? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Dude, I know how <laughs> session work is. I mean, the reality for those that do not know this out there is that, yes, you have artists that endorse certain brands, but behind a studio wall, if there's no pictures being taken, there's no video being shot, Man, anything goes. You can have a producer that's used to a certain set of symbols that has nothing to do with what that artist endorses. And Correct. it just it happens all the time. I mean, there's been albums that you would think that this one brand is on, but it's been Minel and vice versa. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But if we're if I'm gonna use Minels, which is always my go to, right? I would say Two years ago, I would I would be taking a lot of the jazz series stuff, right? The jazz line to me is kind of the cream of the crop. Two years ago, now I would most likely take uh, 15 inch uh, Foundry Reserve hats, a 20 inch Light Ride, and also Foundry Reserve, and then the 22 uh, Medium Ride. That Foundry would kind Reserve. of I that that covers bases. Yeah, oh, 100%. Dude. Yeah, they're pretty much all around symbols, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Don't know that I would play it, them on a like crazy high energy, high volume metal gig, but I mean, you could make they it could work. They could do it if they Yeah. I I took the 22 inch medium ride on my on the last uh two legs of tours we did, which was weirdly enough almost a year ago rehearsal start for that. Wow. And um that ride worked 100% within the style of music that we were playing and then some, you know. So it, it took yeah. a beating and it's sitting up. It's on my drum set right now. I'm looking at it and it's, it's 
it hasn't moved because it, it does so much, you know. And if it's a little too washy, you put a little tape on it, you know. Yeah. I'm curious. You know, you ever hear those people that tell you things like, man, I, I was born at the wrong time. I should have been born at this time, meaning so they could have lived at like through a certain decade or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious. Do you feel like your career has happened at the right time or do you sometimes think you should have been a working drummer in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s? Um, interesting. I, I, I want to say I would have loved to have lived through the 80s, right? And, and to be able to hang with those guys and, and, and I'm talking about the greats, right? Like you got your J.R. Robinsons, you have your, uh, your Jeff Picaros, you, you know, you have this whole era, you have like a, a middle, like mid thirties Vinny. God knows what that guy was like then, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Like there's all these, like, I feel like the eighties would have like been conducive to the way I play. Yeah. Right. No, I get that. But. I think because I have those sensibilities now it fits with whatever I need to play with. Right. Because now it's really all about, can, can you play really close to the grid or on the grid? Can you, you know, can you make it feel good with just one element? So the hi hat or your ride or the side of the rim, or can you overdub this thing? That's going to make it feel like a human, even though you're kicking snare dead on, which was kind of the goal then. Right. So I, I feel like, I feel like, yes, maybe the eighties, but I'm having a blast doing it now. Yeah, no, that's cool. Um, no. you just mentioned something that made me think of something else. So like me being Mr. <clears throat> Rock purist, whenever I listen to a guy like, and I mean, you can do this with other drummers, but from in my immediate sphere, I could listen to a drummer like Alex Van Halen and the way that his snare sounds, it goes beyond the shell, the heads, the mics, the room. It has to do with, you know, how tone comes for a guitar player comes from their fingers. Well, it's the same for drummers. Tone comes from your hands and yeah. the physiology of how you strike the drum. It comes from your feet, but I mean, more so with your hands. Um, I know when I listen to Alex Van Halen hit the snare drum, there's a reason it sounds just like John Bonham to me. I mean, we mm. know that Bonham was a huge influence on Alex Van Halen, but holy shit, like he really pulled it off. His snare really sounds like it's Bonham playing uh, at times. And so I'm curious. I mean, you have such a beautiful and convincing backbeat. Um, it's mm. Thank you. It, it, it's like you said, you've got this like massive amount of precision, but also this great human feel to it. And so I'm curious, has there been somebody along the way that you've admired and even maybe tried to emulate a little bit as far as getting that kind of tone? Yeah. I, I, you know, I mentioned him, Ricky Lawson. I mean, I've, I've, I can't tell you how many times I was in a room watching him hit a snare drum and and his thing was he would use these piccolo snares these like remo that fake wood thing what is it called the uh, oh god i can't remember the name of it i know exactly you know what, what you're i'm talking you about. know what i'm talking about right yeah i can see I the think, badge and everything yeah and his whole thing was he had a bunch of them and i know he used maple drums and brass ones but for the longest period of time he was carrying one that was just maybe like 200 bucks and it was a 14 by three and a half um with super wide uh, uh, snares on the bottom and he, he would put a marching head on top of it and he'd crank the living crap out of it but when he hit that thing man it was like a gunshot straight into your chest it, it was you know it was like um it, to me <laughs> this is a weird analogy but it's kind of like when you stub your toe like it was so like visceral like every time he hit that drum whether it was a side stick whether he was playing it light whether he was playing, playing it super hard and his bass drum was equally that right um, and he, you know, used whatever kind of bass drum was around at, at that church. And where the magic really happened, I think, was in the hi-hat or the, where the movement was happening. And I, f- I feel like this is, if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're like, what the hell is he talking about? Go watch every single session great. Like the real session greats, not the guys that have played on one hit single or two hit singles that they're amazing. But I'm talking like watch Jeff Picaro, watch Shannon Forrest, watch Matt Chamberlain, watch uh, Vinny. What I mean, the list is endless, right? 
I think every single one of those guys, their magic is in their right hand, not their two and four. And what happens is, is how they're, how they're playing the hi-hat, the ride or the movement, right? Allows for the space and the sonic quality of the kick and snare to come out. And so for me, I would watch Ricky play and he was so light and delicate with this hi-hat and he had so much precision and control whether it was on top crazy on top crazy behind the beat dead on and and really knowing every sound he could get out out of just one hi-hat or one ride that allowed for that thunderous beat to come out and i think if you look at even like uh, alex van halen he's he hit super hard right if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah, he does. And he plays giant cymbals, right? Yep. And I would dare to say that in proportion to how hard he's hitting the kick and the snare, he's relatively light with his right hand. Yeah, right? probably so, I, I, yeah. I, I would, I'm just my assumption. So, because I, I haven't gone down that rabbit hole too much. I understand it, and I love his playing, but I haven't gone down that rabbit hole. You know, but like I'm saying, man, you you're, you're actually you're pretty much totally spot on with what you're saying about the right hand providing the space for the kick and snare to sit where they sit, so that you actually think what you're hearing is magic in the kick and snare, but it's really the right hand that's like creating the space. If you listen to Alex Van Halen play this one tune, uh, I'm, I'm getting really geeky, but it's a song called no. I'll Wait. Um, a song called I'll Wait, it's off of their 1984 record. The way he's making that hi-hat, I can almost, like the way he hits it, I, I can hear it and I can see it almost moving up and down in this certain way that um, sort of like... It just dictates exactly where the snare falls. I totally get it. I get exactly what you're saying. That makes complete sense. Yeah, I mean that to me that's the magic and and the thing is you you kind of think back to the jazz greats and it's like the, all the subtlety comes from the right hand. The comping and 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 the left foot stuff and the right foot stuff is great, but like every every jazz great had their signature like ride pattern sound, all of that, right? And I think now that we're playing pop and rock, like that's still true. Like even I'm, it's bringing to mind like Gart's Gart's good. Like I've got him butchering his name, but when you watch Matt play, the way he hits his hi hats and the way he hits like his stack and his crash cymbals and how he's playing ride patterns, they're so distinctly him, even more so than how he hits a kick and a snare. Yeah, no, totally. I can even I can and I can see how he does it in my brain. I mean, yes, I've watched him play a lot, but yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, Acousticon. That was the name of the Remo fake wood. That's what it was. Did you just did you just Google that? While yeah, I, I was did. Yapping? <laughs> I did. I Googled it. <laughs> yeah, I was curious. Um, well, I got two more questions for you, man, and you just made me think of one of them. So, like, what is your go? I want to let people know first of all that you are an absolute coffee purist. Like, you're one <laughs> of those dudes that researches and finds the best stuff. Um, and I'm always impressed with your choices of coffee that you hit me to. So what I want to know is right now, what's your go-to grind that you just can't stay away from? Um, because of the current situation and how difficult it is to get stuff that's fresh, you know, because in California, a lot of the roasters here have been shut down. Uh, and uh, uh, they were for a while. Now they're starting to open up. But anyways, that's a, I'm, I was going to go down a rabbit hole. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Please um, don't. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think right now in my house, I've been doing a lot of Stumptown because it's it's accessible and it's fairly fresh from a lot of the roasters. Or, sorry, a lot of the stores around me. So if I go to uh like you know one of the local chains that's around here they probably have it if i go to a bigger name brand they or a bigger name store they have it uh and they have different options of it and it's usually like if you if you look at the back like i just uh i made cold brew yesterday and the roast date was uh four days ago so that's fine there's wow. also a really 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 awesome oh, i gotta shout him out um local roaster he's like two miles from where i live uh it's, it's a place called the reverse orangutan and he does 
I've sent you stuff from there before. I've given it to you before. And he just does, like, really good coffee at the end of the day. It's just really good, you know. And so uh, I usually try to buy, like, two or three bags from him and see how long that lasts. And then uh, because of quarantine, he was shut down for a while. And now it's, uh, you know, he's opening up again and he's doing a lot more. So I I do that. And I, I'm, I'll be honest. I only do cold brew. I don't do anything else. So mm. that's... Hmm. So That's you're a Stumptown guy, you're a reverse orangutan, and dude, whatever it was you just sent me that was in the box, like oh, that the was, three... that was Blue Bottle. <sighs> I mean, yeah. the whole presentation was insanity. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too cool. Um, last question. So when you're... Yeah. I, I, I tend to ask... I've asked other artists this as well, because I'm always curious. Usually I just get told, nothing, dude, I'm always thinking about music, which is totally fine. I get it. Um, but like when you want to when you want to turn your brain off from what you do for just a few minutes and maybe you want to fart around on your phone, surf around and like what do you look at on your socials that has nothing to do with music in order to kind of like recharge mm-hmm. your brain? Uh, on my socials, uh, I've actually muted. I took this advice from Mike Johnston. He he went as far as to unfollow, I think, but I muted a majority of the drummers that I follow uh, uh, just because it's like uh, I don't care about your paradiddle dickle like I don't like it doesn't matter to me like I not because I'm not impressed it just it's like it's the last thing I want to see if it's something educational I, I it's still there um, and that oddly enough turns my brain off when it's like crazy shreddy gymnastic style drumming it turns my brain off and I hmm. just look at it like entertainment um not because there isn't art, but because it's so unattainable for me that I'm like, I, why am I even, uh, okay, cool. Next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, I, I, I'll play like, uh, like NBA 2k if I really want to shut off, but I can only do so much of that cause I don't want to just sit around. Um, during this quarantine and prior to the, to this, um, Andy and his wife, Asia, we're in their last trimester of have uh, before having a kid, so we were initially going to be off. I think for, I think it was like two or three months, and so at the beginning of the year we were working a bunch, and then as February March came through, we completely shut down. Not for quarantine, but it just kind of worked out that way. They had their baby, and we were, you know, we had some time off. Anyways, during that time, I discovered my love of really long walks with my dog, and oh, nice. Um, I usually listen to a podcast right now. I'm educating myself with the current situation that's happening. Um, It's just like a good time for me to not be on my phone. Listen, take things in. Sometimes I don't listen. Uh, There was like a period where I, I was doing like five or six miles every day of just walking with my dog and just absorbing. It's not nature because I live in a city, but you know, it's like not not staring at a screen and that that has been so valuable um uh, i forget who i was talking to but i was like i think this is what's keeping me sane honestly oh yeah no i mean dude fresh air relatively fresh air and sunshine is uh, always (laughs) a good thing um so you said when you're um walking you're listening to podcasts trying to educate yourself on the current situation happening so without going deep uh because i like to try and keep these podcasts um Rel- you know, somewhat free from that stuff. When you say the current situation, you're talking about the current civil situation, not the health situation. Yeah, yeah, the current, you know, the stuff with uh, police brutality against our African American brothers and sisters, uh, our, uh, you know, the trans, the trans rights stuff that's going on. Uh, there's just so much happening. The quarantine and COVID stuff that's happening, and so I listen to a lot of podcasts from a lot of different sources. Uh, right. Okay. That was my question. That's my a, question. So I don't everything... only eat one thing because I feel like it's really easy to go down that rabbit hole. Right. I mean, I, yeah, yes. My question is, do you listen, do you even make yourself listen to stuff that you know, you're not going to agree with? But 100%. That you... Okay, good, good. And I'm not 100%. saying, I'm not saying good. Like I approve of you. It's more like <laughs> I, I do the same thing. I read rather than podcasts. I read the news. 
And mm. there's a website called Real Clear Politics, and it's an aggregate site. I mean, they have a Real Clear History or a Real Clear Sports, but yeah. Real Clear Politics. And so if there's a subject that's a hot topic at the moment, they'll have back-to-back links of Fox News's op-ed piece on that particular subject, and then they'll have Slate or Politico's or the huh. Atlantic's um, their take on that situation. So it's kind of sad because used to back in the day, you could just read Reuters or Associated Press, like their facts, and then you could deduce what you wanted to based off of your own way of thinking. Yeah, and I, I, that- I actually am looking at my history and I read uh, an article today about the law that was passed about uh, you not being able to get fired for your job regardless of your gender or sex um so and it was on real clear politics so oh ah, okay it, well it's yeah a good i mean website. now basically i have to read two articles to find out like the facts uh because yeah. the facts and i put those uh, those two words within quotes. quotation marks yeah <laughs> and they are couched in someone's opinion usually and um yeah, so that's why I, I tend to. It's like I do have to go to double the double the trouble to like figure out what I think about something, you know. Um, if I want to gather facts and then make a decision or form an opinion, whatever. Anyway, dude, E man, thank you so yeah. much for doing this, man. This was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure just hanging with you and chatting. But this was super cool, man. Thank you. No, thank you, and. Uh... Uh, I have to say this. I mean, if if Mino wants to give me some money, I'll take it. But <laughs> shit, uh, I knew I shouldn't have brought that up. Yeah. <laughs> you'll you'll get my invoice. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> right on. I mean, not right on. Um, <laughs> dude, thank you so much, brother. No, thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to Mino Radio. If you liked this episode, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. We would appreciate it very much. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.